Hello, everybody. Welcome to this talk about Soundware. My name is uh, Vinod Kol. I work for Linaro, and uh, uh, I maintain Soundware subsystem in the Linux kernel, along with some other bits like DMA engine and some audio stuff. So Soundware is one of the new protocols which has been uh, uh, being developed by the MIPI. It's a MIPI standard, and uh, uh, I wrote the initial bus framework for that, and we upstreamed it. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So to start with the agenda is basically we'll go on why Soundware and what it tries to solve, which is not kind of done by the existing uh, audio protocols available out there. Uh, then we'll move to the bit of topologies, kind of build up how Soundware evolves and how Soundware tries to deal things differently as compared to other stuff. And then we'll move into the protocol, kind of try to skim the surface of protocol. It's quite vast protocol and quite complicated, in fact, in my opinion. But then it won't be, you know, we can't do justice to it in next 30, 40 minutes. So we'll just skim the surface, introduce the topics a bit, and then uh, move over to the Linux uh, subsystem, introduce the APIs bit and uh, data structures a bit. Standards, we all know. There are always n number standards. We try to solve that with n plus one standard and then it becomes n plus one standard. So hopefully, uh, Soundware will not be like that as we always try to wish, but we'll see how it pans out in the future. There has been quite decent interest in both uh, SOC folks as well as uh, Codec vendor folks. So probably we'll see devices shipping Soundware probably next year and uh, more adoption by the vendors. So uh, in comparison to the existing audio standards, first what comes to your mind is HD audio. This is something which probably you run on your laptop or your desktop. Uh, HD audio was done way back in early 2000, uh, driven pre predominantly by Intel. And it's PC-centric, uh, takes a lot number of pins, and uh, is not really friendly with respect to power. Uh, so embedded world or mobile world doesn't use it. So what they do is they have, we do I2S on that, uh, or TDM as we call it. Uh, again, the pin count on this bus is not great. It doesn't do control. So you need to have always a sideband I2C or SPI to do control and GPIOs. Uh, then we also have a PDM, which is basically direct attach microphones. You can connect them to your SOC or your codecs. So PDM, again, that limitation is that you can only have two devices, and then on a particular link, you can't do command and control. Uh, then before Soundware uh, was developed, there was another MIPI protocol, uh, the nth protocol. Uh, it's called Slimbus. Uh, uh, people tried to solve all these problems with the Slimbus, but eventually there was not widespread adoption because of various factors, primarily being the complexity of the protocol was too much, and people couldn't do simpler devices. The cost of doing simple devices was very much in terms of transistors. Uh, so that led to Soundware, which kind of can be viewed as a, a, a improved version of Slimbus in a lot of uh, terminologies. So what does it try to do, or what sh when the so Soundware development started, what people wanted to do out of Soundware was that we should have a bus which has a lesser pin count, and uh, uh, we can do both command as well as control. Uh, when we say control, it's not just register read writes, but also kind of have a capability to wake the system up so that we can eliminate the need of the external GPIOs on the system. Then uh, Slimbus, initially, although it was targeted to do PCM and PDM, but unfortunately, there were restrictions on how the PDM evolved on the protocol, so PDM was never really supported. But with this protocol, we try to uh, have both PCM as well as PDM supported. Uh, Multi-drop is another feature which comes to mind because if you look at I2S, I2S is predominantly you have point-to-point -point link or PDM is point-to-point -point link. So it would help uh, doing device terminal topologies if we have a multi-drop bus. And then as usual, you want to solve the problem not just for embedded or mobile, but for PCs as well. So in this respect, how we build the term, uh, topologies for Soundware are like you initially start with a simple case where you have a master which is on the application processor and you kind of partition it in uh, uh, that master particular driving your codecs, which can be speakers or amplifiers or microphones and so forth. And it's a simple description. And then what we can do is have additional masters and uh, split them into different functions as given in this diagram. Like you have all the rendering devices like playback on one master and on the capture, 
or do different like a simple dumb codec which is basically implementing your wired headset and another smart speaker or digital speaker as we can call it. So this is just a simple topology but if we try to make it more complicated, we can have a multi uh, lane system uh, where if you look at from this point, uh, this topology point of view, you have single master and that single master is able to drive a quite modern complicated mobile uh, to audio topology where you have a codec connected as well as a modem connected, probably a DSP as well, BTFM chip. And if you notice in this diagram, uh, not all data lanes are required to go to master. So you can have a communication in this case where master is not really involved and two slaves can directly talk to each other. So this is the kind of use cases which uh, uh, Soundware tries to solve, how it goes we'll see probably next year down the line when devices hit market. But that's the main motivation of why we want to do Soundware. Uh, another is like bridge topologies, uh, if your device lengths or other things really have some limitation, so you can also implement a bridge where a device is master on one side and kind of slave and doing a bridging in between. So this kind of gives us a little bit of motivation on what should we expect from Soundware protocol. So let's uh, go into the protocol a little bit. So as you can see in the previous diagrams, it's a two pin bus which has data and clock. We can do both 1.2 and 1.8 volts. And then uh, as we see in the multi-lane diagram, you can have multiple uh, data lanes. If your bandwidth is not sufficient or you want to have complex audio topologies, you can do multiple data lanes. Then uh, it's a serial bus, but it's a dual data rate bus. So what it essentially means when your clock is rendered both on the rising edge as well as on the falling edge, we will sample data. So that essentially drives your bandwidth 2x as compared to your clock rate of the bus. And then uh, frame length, typically if you look at any of the serial bus protocols, you will have a frame where you have a dedicated header and then a payload and then that's fixed for the duration and uh, you will not be able to adjust to it. But typically, if you look at audio pro, uh, user scenarios, you may be probably rendering to your uh, uh, headset and then you want to start a capture session as well or you have a Bluetooth chime coming in or stuff like that. So in this case, your bandwidth requirements are not static. They keep on uh, increasing or decreasing based on what you want to do with the bus. So as a result, uh, you may want to have a for a feature where uh, your frame length is also variable. You can change it on the fly runtime without having to uh, sacrifice in audio quality. So that is something which uh, Soundware tries to solve as well. Uh, then uh, as a consequence, we don't have a static clock. We can scale dynamically the clock right up to 12.8 megahertz, which is basically the electrical limit of the protocol right now. Then uh, since it's also uh, predominantly focused on a mobile ecosystem or embedded ecosystem. Uh, people want to be have uh, it to be more power friendly. So uh, at runtime, we can do a clock stop and uh, do a power down of the whole bus. And obviously, it supports both PCM and PDM. Uh, along with that, uh, in case of audio, we since it's targeting audio, we have both isochronous as well as asynchronous support of the audio rates. Essentially, it m helps you to run on a particular clock rate, both 44.1 at 48 kilohertz kind of frequency sets. So that's quite helpful because a lot of protocols are not able to do that, so you rely on external mechanisms to do that. So uh, as a whole modern audio embedded ecosystem evolved uh, in last, let's say, five or eight years, we have seen evolution of DSPs. Now, DSP may be on the SOC side or on the codec side, but if it's on the codec side, what codec guys want is to be able to load huge blob of data, which are basically your coefficients and uh, uh, your parameters. So typically what they will do, they will write a, put a side spy bus on it and then uh, drive the data blobs through that. So Soundware tries to solve by having a dedicated bulk transfer capability and you can do tons of register writes and that have very good bandwidth, uh, depending on, again, implementation of your master and the slave devices. Uh, bandwidths of megabits are possible. Okay. Then uh, low gate count. So one of the good things about the protocol definition was for the master, a lot of things are mandatory, but for the slave, some things, uh, most of the things are actually optional. 
So what that does is you can make a really good uh, big complex slave system, but then you can also go and design, reduce uh, the all optional features and come up with a set of uh, device which is very simplistic in nature and your gate count ultimately goes down. So that helps in having a simpler implementations and drive the cost down, hopefully adoption as well. And uh, device, uh, sorry, uh -huh. on uh, protocol control point of view, we can enumerate what is on the bus and uh, it will uh, we can find out when the devices show up or when they are not uh, latched onto the bus. So that is uh, allowed in the spec, uh, but the whole uh, enumeration process is driven by the software. So software needs to play a little bit of role here. We'll go into that a little bit. Then uh, uh, the soundware current uh, version is, spec version is 1.1 and it uh, uh, doesn't define uh, de uh, device classes, but then there's a provision for it in the spec. So in future, uh, we should expect that some people will come up with, there's already work going on, MEP work group for that. So we can have device classes. So what essentially means is for simpler devices like microphones or speaker, people should not be able to writing additional software. Uh, your device class software will be able to handle that just like kind of a USB based uh, device concepts. So that is still work in progress that has not been done, but spec has provision for it already. So it's not like we left, we left the door closed at the moment. Okay, so we've been talking about various device types. Let's look into what are the actual devices. The first master. So master is a device which is supposed to drive your clock and does the data handling. Then uh, it, uh, we, call, uh, we have a concept called bus keeper. So it means that it, only, it will assign who should be driving a bit slot. So coming back, oh, what is a bit slot? A uh, bit slot, since I said that it's a double data rate bus and we are uh, pumping data on both the edges of the clock, in this case what it means is each edge of the clock is referred to as a bit slot. So that's kind of a terminology soundware spec uses. So uh, it will do the bus management and uh, assign owners of each bit slot who is allowed to drive on that particular bit slot, who is not. And uh, that is essentially a role of master. Then uh, we have slave. Uh, slave, we can, as we said, audio peripherals like microphone, codecs, or speakers. And then uh, up to 11 slaves can be connected on a bus. Uh, 11 is a magic number. We'll go into details on why a little bit later. Uh, it can interrupt. It can wake up the system. So assuming you have done an audio implementation and uh, uh, you would, when you're idle, you would expect that you will power down everything and then somebody inserts check. So it has in-band signaling mechanisms so that it can wake up both itself as well as the master on the AP. So that's allowed. Similarly, it can uh, interrupt. So there's a thing, uh, there's some event, let's say you have a DSP implemented in a codec and then so you detected some funny words, you can uh, wake the system up or interrupt the system up with those things. Uh, and it reports status, that's basically, so we have two types of statuses. One is uh, master sta uh, sound uh, spec status where it can tell what is your current uh, uh, device state and everything. And then there's an implementation defined which can be basically based on what your device implementation is. There's another piece of interesting equipment called monitor in the spec. So what monitor essentially means is you have a sophisticated test equipment which you can attach on a bus and then it can snoop and uh, help you in debug and test. And there are a couple of vendors who provide uh, soundware monitors in the market today. Uh, and if you desire, it can also take over the bus management from the master and start issuing the commands. But even in this case, but still the bus the master has to continue bumping the clock. That's not allowed to do by the master. Data ports, so since it's geared towards audio, so one of the things what uh, spec defines is a concept of data ports. So each master and slave have to define how many data ports they support and it's basically a logical entity where you will uh, send or receive the uh, transmission protocol, sorry, uh, payload data. And uh, as I said, uh, since people want to have implementations where they can simplify, the data port is mandatory, but the type of data port is optional. You can have a very simplistic data port which doesn't do much of the uh, fancy bells and whistles features, but then you can have a complete data port which does a lot of things extra. So the types of data port will be either simple, which is very dumb now, doesn't do anything, or reduced where it can have some capabilities, or full where it has all the capabilities supported by the spec. 
Then uh, uh, again, uh, on a particular device, we can have up to 15 data ports. Zero is always reserved for bulk transfer capability. So we've talked about bulk transfer for writing large blobs of data. So if, you, if a device supports that, it should support the data port zero. Then uh, data port one to 14 are reserved for audio functions. This is where actual audio streams are directed towards. And 15 is basically an alias to one to 15 ports. So if you have something like broadcast you want to send out or receive, that's done by the data port one to four, uh, sorry, data port 15. How does the frame look like? <laughs> Interesting bit now. So as you can see in this diagram, uh, uh, Soundware spec defines a frame as a combination of row S and columns, and these are the uh, can I do this? Yeah. these are the loud rows and column values. It row starts from two onwards, and the max value it can go is 16. Column from 48 onwards, and max I guess is somewhere 250. And as you can see, there's a nice correlation between these diagrams. Uh, sorry, these values uh, based on audio frequencies you want to support. And uh, a particular frame is combination of row and columns. So uh, in this case, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, we also need to send a control word, which is basically your command and control uh, field. And always the first row is, first row, 48 columns are dedicated, uh, sorry, 48 rows of the first column are always dedicated to the control word. Rest can be dedicated for your audio data air, bulk transfer as you would do necessary. This is all decided by the master at the time of uh, initiation and before it starts to program. So a PCM can be allocated slots in any rows or columns, we'll see. And PDM by its nature, uh, it generates one bit at a time. So it's recommended that you generate, have a one particular uh, column dedicated for PDMs. Uh, that essentially ensures that you don't have any conflict between PCM, PDM, and control word. Okay, uh, now these number of uh, rows and columns are chosen, so this kind of, sorry, hold on, one more thing. So as you can see in the serial transmission case, we will always transmit the row first, followed by all the columns of that particular row, and then row. So it's kind of basically a raster scan uh, kind of mechanism. This also ensures uh, for things like PDM that you keep on bumping a bit at a time on the column as and when they arrive if your clock rates are matching. Also ensures that uh, if you are sending this control word on, the, uh, on a row zero, if you have momentary some errors on the bus, your errors are getting distributed evenly and it's not that couple of bit errors are completely making your control word go for a toss. Based on these rows and columns, this is a couple of examples of typical common usages of rows and uh, frame shapes. So this is a 48 cross two, where this particular row will be dedicated for your control word 48 bits, and then we can send audio data on this column. Uh, this 48 cross two is very commonly used in case you want to be doing a simple playback to 24 of a 24 bit stereo, which you will probably see in your headset or your speakers. So this is the most common uh, uh, frame shape you will encounter. Then you can also have this other examples, 48 cross four, where uh, you may want to be doing uh, both playback and capture, as you might have noticed if you do that with 24 bit audio, uh, you will be only occupying two columns and one column will go waste. So that's up to system designer to choose what kind of topology he wants to support, what kind of rates he wants to support, and how the column shape should be arrived at. From the implementation point of view, bus right now doesn't choose anything. It's left to the master because master knows the system very well. So we query what kind of, given the bandwidth, what kind of frame shape would you like to support? Another example, so as uh, rows will go uh, beyond 64 because we can go all the way up to, sorry, 48 to all the way up to 64 and you can pack this with audio data or bulk transfer data. And you might have noticed this particular bit after 48 data is kind of left for payload, but in practical circumstances, I have never found a use for it till now. It's kind of gets waste. So 48 bits of control word, how do they look like? This is what we transmit. Uh, on a particular control word, there can be three types of commands. It can be ping, read, or write. 
when it's ping, it can be either ping request from the slave. So a slave can say, uh, can you send a ping command? In that case, uh, they will assert this ping request and uh, master will send the ping command. Or it can be a read write, which is opcode of one and three, where read write is basically a register read write for the slaves. Uh, if we are doing register read write, then we put device address here, register address for the device in these bits from eight onwards. Uh, all the way up down to 23, and then the register read write data is in this 33 to 40 bit. So this is how a register read or write will be performed. Uh, if we are not doing register read write, then things are interesting because we are doing a ping command. Uh, ping command is essentially a way for, it can be initiated by either master or by the ping request, by a way for the master to know what all the slaves are doing and how the, uh, is there any status update on those. Uh, we were talking about ma monitor brief uh, previously, so if there's a monitor and it wants to relinquish the control of the bus, they can do that by asserting the bus request bit, and whenever master is ready, it can do that by uh, giving the bus release bit here. When the ping command is issued, each slave on the bus who is attached is supposed to send a status. That is given in, since we have 11 slaves, so all the 11 slaves can give status bit two bits. Uh, we'll go into status a little bit later. Uh, this is all slave status. And then we have this static bit definition all the way from 24 to 31. This is essentially sync word. So when, uh, when you boot the system and the clock is start triggered, at that time a slave has to synchronize to the master clock. And this is the way it does it by listening on this particular sync word. It will try to listen on the sync word. Once it's detected a sync word, it will derive the frame shape information, frequency information, and then latch onto the bus. Along with the scene, uh, this fixed uh, sync word, there's all, also a provision of 41 to 44 bits, which is basically a dynamic sync. So this sync word is supposed to be designed in such a way that it's not commonly found in audio payload, but then what if? The probability is very low, so that is why they want to minimize that low probability even further by having a dynamic sync bits, four bits. It's essentially pseudo-random binary sequence and uh, that eliminates the possibility of you latching onto the uh, fake sync. Okay, so what else is remaining are these three bits. So this is the parity for your frame. So you want to check what's the parity on that and do verification. So at the and assuming we are doing a read or write, uh, you have sent the opcode here, device address, register address, and if it's a read, uh, sorry, write, the write data is here. If it's a read, the slave is supposed to put read data here. So within this particular frame, you have actually performed the whole read or write operation. And the result of that operation is given in these two bits. So this is where the slave will tell you, uh, is the read successful or a write successful by asserting these NAC or add bits. Okay. Now, uh, in the previous diagram, if you see, there's a device address. We'll go how this device address is derived. Uh, each uh, slave on uh, MIPI device is supposed to implement a 48-bit device address. And how that 48-bit is formed is first 16 bits are manufacturer ID. This is a standard MIPI manufacturer code assigned by MIPI Alliance, and you can find it on mid.mipi.org. Uh, each uh, vendor has a specific code, just like your PCI device ID code. Then uh, each vendor will, on its own parts, assign a 16-bit part ID for their particular parts they're doing. Uh, one unique thing about audio devices is you may have on a particular master same kind of devices and uh, uh, how do you uniquely distinguish between them. Uh, for example, you may have four microphones attached and doing a uh, beam forming application. So in this case, Soundware allows you to have four additional bits for unique ID. So this is left to the implementers how they want to implement it, probably a GPI pull down or whatever, and uh, or a particular a board uh, fuse programming. So that allows you to uniquely address same class of devices with the same type of devices within a particular bus. Uh, along with that, we dedicate four bits to versioning. So, so right now, Soundware protocol version is 1.1, so that's what we should expect a bus to read. There was a 1.0, but then I don't think anybody implemented that. Uh, as we said, there's a future revision for classes. So. Uh, it's still reserved bit, they have not defined it yet. Uh, okay, 
So this 48 bit is what uniquely identifies that, but then your control word itself is 48 bits. So we cannot really send 48 bits to address a device. So there's always a translation from device address to device number, which is our four bit value, which we saw in the uh, control word. So this four bit value uh, where is assigned by the master to the particular uh, slaves. And uh, this, uh, uh, okay, so uh, this plays a role in the enumeration. Stay a little bit for a couple of slides with this. So zero number for device number is for devices which are attached to the bus. It essentially means that you're synchronized to the clock, you understand what is the frame shape running and uh, so forth. And when you are properly attached and you are assigned a device number by the bus, that is when you will be in the device one to 11. 12 and 13 is reserved for the group, so you can group class of devices. Let's say you have two microphones or you have two speakers which are identical and you want to program that all at the same time because you, it's a stereo speaker. You won't want to program them independently. So you can create a group of devices which you are always communicating at the same time and programming the same time. So this can be done by two groups, 12 and 13. 14 is reserved for master use, which you can it can do for internal programming. 15 is a broadcast uh, device number. So if you send a command with 15 uh, as a device number, so all the slaves are supposed to respond to that. Now, this kind of solves the mystery why we can only support 11 devices because of this partitioning. Now, in, on the enumeration, that's only the missing piece in this particular puzzle. So when the, you are synchronized to the clock, uh, you will have a ping command issued or you can request a ping command. At that point of time, slave will report that it's attached on device number zero. This is the default boot sequence for a particular slave. Then the software will go and read the 48-bit device ID, which is device now uh, register zero to five, and then it will assign a particular device number to the particular slave. So once it's assigned from the anywhere value from one to 11, we need to program it back to the device. So if, uh, we do a device number programming on device number register. Once that is done, slave has to again come back and report attached on that particular device. So if you see, go back to this. So this is a slave status, assuming we are programming on device number six. Initially, he will come and tell me I am attached on zero. We'll go and read the register, uh, assign it, let's say a slave number six, and then uh, it will say attached here. This is where the enumeration cycle completes. Okay, uh, the device number is dynamic in nature, so that means once you assign it, it's not there forever, it can be lost. If you lose the clock, you're no longer synchronized, you will come back and say, I'm reporting again attached on device number zero, so you reprogram it back. Then uh, if you are doing a very, very low power domain where you lose sync to the clock, you don't, because uh, after some time, uh, master may have done some more uh, changes to the frame shape, so the older clock which you had assumption was no, is no longer valid. So you need to again listen to the clock and uh, synchronize again. So in this case, they, we always go back and say attached on device zero whenever they synchronized, okay? Uh, Soundware spec implements a lot of nice things. It allows you to find out what device is there on the bus and uh, enumerate it, but it doesn't tell me what that device is. If I get a device on the bus with a part number foo and uh, manufacturer number bar, I have no idea what to do with it. Uh, so in this case, uh, wise guys at maybe came up with a um, spec called DISCO, uh, which is, uh, stands for discovery and configuration. So what this spec does is it uh, implements a lot of properties for master and slave. Uh, these properties by spec definition are optional, but in Linux subsystem, we have taken a view that these properties are mandatory if you want to get Linux support. This is for the simple reason that we now know what to do with a particular slave, how to program it, what are the timeout values, what are the registers implemented, does it have a data port simple, reduced, or complex, uh, what kind of capabilities does the device have. Uh, we're not leaving, we're not talking about audio functionality yet, but from the soundware protocol point of view, what does it implement and how many registers can I read and write. So this is what uh, Disco spec implements. It specifies uh, these properties as ACPI, DSD methods, or device tree uh, and, uh, properties. Uh, current implementation actually supports ACPI. We don't do DT yet. 
uh, it describes uh, what the capabilities of your master or slave are, okay? Now, switching gears to the Linux, this is how the bus looks like. So this is the bus structure which is uh, uh, created by the master and then we initialize it. First member is the device ID pointer. This points to your uh, master device. Then we have link ID. So you may have multiple masters implemented. So we assign each a unique link to uniquely identify it. Uh, master can have multiple slaves. So we create a, store them in the link list of slaves. Uh, since each bus needs to keep track of all the zero uh, sorry, one to 11 device numbers and who is assigned and which is not assigned. That is done by using the assigned bitmap. Uh, for synchronization purpose, uh, Soundwire can do both control and uh, streaming. So for messaging, which is basically your IO, we use a separate messaging lock and for a streaming purpose, we use a separate messaging lock. Uh, reason for these two different locks is essentially to be able to do parallel operations because typically the register programming and audio programming can run in parallel and we can push the throughput here. Then uh, since uh, one of the not so good things which I personally don't like about the protocol is it specifies good uh, transmission protocol. It specifies how slaves should be implemented, but then it leaves a completely uh, blank on how a master should be implemented. There are no master or host controller interface specification specified in Soundwire protocols. So the bus cannot assume anything about the master. So in order for it to program anything on the bus master, it needs the help of the master device. Oh, sorry, wrong button. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So it uh, needs uh, master to provide bunch of callback ops for master programming as well as master port programming. Then uh, uh, Soundwire bus, uh, based on the use cases, it will do bus uh, parameter calculation, what is the frame shape bandwidth required. So those are stored in this. Then we had disco properties, those are stored in the master properties. Uh, since the intended scenario is audio and audio streams can come and go at any point of time, we track them through the runtime list. Uh, Soundware supports deferred messaging, that is tracked through the deferred messaging. And then we have a bunch of clock uh, timeouts for bank switch and clocks. Uh, last is the multi-link. So on top of Soundware, at least what Intel has done is uh, to drive more complex usages, they take two masters and tie them together and try one stream over it. One of the examples can be, uh, let's say you have a big uh, microphone array, like 16 microphones, you can attach eight on one bus, on eight on one other, four on one or multiple or multiple speakers and so forth. So in that case, your stream uh, can consist of multiple uh, masters. So if that is the case, we set this flag as true and do the things appropriately in the bus. And these are the APIs. So once you have this data structure, you allocate it, and then you can invoke Soundware add bus master API. This will uh, initialize the uh, rest of the data structures and start initial scanning your firmware. So if you are implementing a CPI system or if you're implementing a device tree system, you, although it's an enumerable bus, you still need to describe uh, your device, Soundware devices in your firmware. Uh, one of the reasons for that is, uh, although it's enumerable, it's not discoverable, so we don't know a lot of properties on it. So we rely on ACPI and device tree to do that. Uh, so it will do the scanning of the firmware, respective firmware, and start adding the slaves. And that's when your uh, slave device objects are created. Once the slave device or object is created, if you have a driver for it, that driver will be probed. And uh, okay. Looking at master ops, so this is what the master ops you are supposed to implement. Uh, read property uh, is where is a callback which you can provide to read the disco properties implemented for your particular device. Uh, transfer message is for transferring the data message onto the uh, bus. Since we don't have a host control spec, we can't do that on our own. We rely on master to do that for us. Then uh, you, we do we can do deferred messaging for that. There's a different callback. Uh, for uh, so, so one of the things I missed out pointing out was that Soundware supports multiple register pages. 
So you can have multiple register pages and you can address uh, a lot of, uh, uh, I think 65 kilobyte of uh, register space with that. So uh, in this case, uh, more the soundware spec implementation is actually on the page zero. So whenever we want to do a soundware slave programming, uh, we need to always reset page address zero. So that's a quick callback to do that. Then whenever you have a bus configuration, you can set it using this callback. And uh, uh, one of the things which Soundware does, as I was talking, is uh, having the capability of dynamically adding and uh, uh, a use case without uh, doing any glitches, which is kind of unique to the Soundpad protocol as compared to other usages. So you know how that is done is uh, uh, Soundware, uh, you uh, find out what are the parameters you want for the uh, new stream to be added, then program that. And once all of everybody is programmed, configured, we do the switch of the whole uh, system at one point of time, so because Soundware implements two banks. So there you have a shadow uh, bank one, you can keep on programming on the alternate bank and then switch onto the bank at the same time, all the devices are synced and switched. So this ensures that there are no glitches in the audio, you program everything. So for that, we have a couple of callbacks to master to let it know that we are going to perform a bank switch before and after. Slave, uh, slave device, simple kind of a Linux device where we track what is a 48-bit device ID, then embed this uh, Linux struct device uh, as done by the other devices. Uh, slave status, uh, is it enumerated, is it attached, it is detached, that's what we track here then pointer to the bus it's part of. And slave also needs some operations for the same port programming and uh, uh, the, the, uh, port programming as well as for the uh, link programming. So that is done through the uh, mass slave ops. Again, we have disco properties for slaves, so those are stored here. And it's part of the bus link list, to note for that. And once the ports are programmed, because you can have multiple pro programs, so you can program them asynchronously and wait on them. So we have a completion for that. And finally, the device number, which is assigned. This is how the Soundware driver looks like. If you're implementing a driver, this is all the most interesting structure for you. Name, probe, remove, shutdown, as in case of the standard next driver. Then your ID table for the devices and your slave ops. So how do you register a slave? If you're implementing a slave driver, you need to call Soundware register slave driver and that will register a device for you. Uh, before that, we would have done uh, a scan of the firmware for your Soundware devices. So on this, your probe method will get called and uh, your device is, uh, your driver is attached to the device. But with a word of caution, at this point of time, your slave is not attached. So do not attempt to communicate with the slave on probe. That's a little tricky because that's the way protocol works. Only when you have attached, then you can attempt to do any communication with the protocol, uh, for, with your device. So until you get a, a attached a status update, do not attempt to call the bus. Okay, so we probe only on the man manufacturer ID and part ID. Instance ID is not used for obvious reasons. And uh, on device enumeration, we update the status to the driver. This is when you can start reading the registers of the device. These are the slave ops. We have read property. Uh, since we do, can do interrupts, we have interrupt callback for that. Then whenever a status changes, we bus let the uh, slave know what is the status. Uh, whenever bus config changes, we have a bus config callback, so it lets know what is the new configuration. And whenever ports are prepared or deprepared, we will let know. Uh, device know about the port parameters. Now, coming back to disco properties, uh, since we said it's mandatory for the software, we provide two nice APIs, Soundware Master Read Property and Soundware Slave Read Property. So these uh, callback, uh, these uh, APIs will go and read your respective firmware, if it's a device tree or uh, ACPI. We don't actually care because we use uh, nice callbacks called device property callbacks, which are agnostic to the firmware implementation you have. And it will go and read the standard disco specific size, specified properties, and uh, it will initialize your uh, property uh, data structure. Now, uh, 
The property callbacks are mandatory, but it is not mandatory to call these two APIs. You can have your own implementation. It is mandatory to provide a callback, but what that callback does is up to the implementer. So if you are fully compliant with Disco spec, you can just point it out to these two uh, APIs. If you are not, you can have your own implementation. If you are partially there and partially not there, then you can call in your own implementation the standard APIs and then put your secret sauce on top of it. Okay? IO. How are we doing in time? Yeah. So, IO, we have read and write callbacks. Uh, sorry, soundware read and soundware write APIs. These are basically your register read and write APIs. And then we also have a something like end read or end write, which allow you to read a uh, contiguous uh, memory uh, bunch of registers. But in practice, I expect nobody to use those APIs because they should be using RegMap. RegMap support is already available. So since we do audio, uh, how's the audio stream look like? So this is the audio stream. Uh, we allocate a stream object for whenever uh, there's an audio instance going on. Uh, we track the stream parameters, state of the stream, and what is the type, which is basically PDM and PCM. And we link, we find, and stream can have multiple masters. So a list of masters in this. Uh, Sorry, uh, one quick thing about this is we can have multiple, uh, we can have one or more masters. At least one master is mandatory in a stream. It may be the case that you actually do not have a master in a stream. You may be doing a slave to slave communication, but you still need a bus master to drive the clock. So a data port of master is not mandatory, but a master is mandatory. Similarly, we can have one or more slaves in the stream. And the master slave are represented by soundware master runtime and soundware slave runtime data structures. Uh, streaming APIs, you can allocate the stream object using soundware allocate stream and free that up with the release stream. Once you have allocated the object, you can add the masters using stream add master or stream add slave. So if you are a slave implementer, you just need to make sure that you are calling add slave. If you are a master implementer, you need to call allocate and add master. Then uh, once your object is allocated, you need to prepare the stream. This is typically done from the audio callbacks by, by uh, uh, hardware params it should be linked to your prepare stream. And uh, if you're doing enable, it should be typically called from your start stream. Similarly, disable and deprepare. Okay, uh, what do we do in streaming is we calculate the bandwidth and the frame shape required and then program the transport parameters. Again, in this case, we will perform a bank switch to enable the new transport. Then we configure the ports and enable the ports and bank switch to enable the ports actually. So converse is done on the teardown. Uh, current status, quickly. So Soundware subsystem was actually merged in 4.16 uh, Linux and then uh, streaming support we added in 4.20. Multilink support is actually in Linux next and will go for 4.20. RegMap I is also available. Uh, we have Intel Soundware controller as well as the Cadence IP block which Intel implements. Uh, what is remaining is SysFS support for properties uh, and then the debug support. I have patches probably they will go in 4.21 along with the uh, device tree support for these devices. Uh, these are the links. This is a link to MIP spec. Unfortunately, you need to be a MIP member to be able to access this spec. The disco spec is freely available because it's a software spec. And then this is the link to the source tree and documentations. Uh, questions? Yep. Can you explain what Cisco SM is? Uh, it's, uh, Maybe uh, uh, something, I don't know. It, whenever we use Disco, we are supposed to use SM with it. What's Disco? Uh, discovery and configuration spec. It's defined by maybe. Okay. So besides PCM and PDM, mm -hmm. please support BSD? Sorry? Uh, I'm talking about the data format. It supports PCM, yes. right? yep. PDM. Right. And there's also uh, a data format Mm, no, it doesn't support that. Okay. Okay. Yep. What's the vendor support like? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> so I know uh, uh, everybody in audio ecosystem has a soundware master or slave based on where they reside. Uh, upstream support is only there for Intel and uh, 
Uh, next year is when I know that there will be devices shipping uh, with somewhere in them, uh, and you can buy them off the market. In the, off the market. Uh, I expect by end of next year, you will have a significant support for uh, devices, both in Linux as well as in the ecosystem. Good question. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have a crystal ball to tell you that. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there any plan to release the spec? Uh, spec is there. If you are a MAPA member, you can go and download it. I mean, to learn bundle? Uh, that's not my call, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, have there been any attempts to measure the round trip latency with uh, compared to uh, I2S? Um, nope but I don't expect it to be any worse. We don't have production system to measure the latency yet, but uh, it, it would be much, much better as compared to I2S, as, uh, uh, as, compa as compared to I2S is what I would presume. Yep. Nope. So the question from Liam is, uh, we have a prepare callback, and uh, we, since it's invoked from the audio hardware params, we should rename it to hardware params. Unfortunately, no, because uh, prepare is a stream state in Soundware, and we want to pr move from the stream, stream transition to prepare state, so that is why it's a prepare. Uh, if tomorrow audio guys make it something else, we should not change this API, or it can be called from non-audio context, hypothetically. I agree. I agree we had a good debate and uh, our friend Pierre has a lot of to, lot to say on that, so we'll stick with prepare for now. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Sorry? Uh, eight bits. Uh, I think it's eight bits, I'll check again. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Uh, does the protocol limit me in some way regarding the audio sampling? Uh, can you, yeah. So I'm asked to stop so this, I'll answer. So let's talk after this because uh, probably people are waiting for the next session. So thank you very much for attendance and hopefully this was helpful. Thank you.